If you want to be a better writer, there are three things you need to do. First, understand storytelling principles. Second, see how other writers have applied those principles. And then thirdly, use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory and we'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor and poet, and I have a passion for middle grade and young adult stories, spy stories, fairy tales and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for and about women. On today's episode, Valerie pitched The Power of the Dog so that we can study genre. It was written and directed by Jane Campion, who won a Golden Globe, a BAFTA and an Oscar for Best Director. It's based on the 1967 novel The Power of the Dog, which was written by Thomas Savage. And just a reminder, there are spoilers in this episode because we can't talk about the story without talking about the story. Over to you, Valerie. Oh, Melanie, I did it again. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you did. (laughs) Okay, this is a film, seriously, we could talk about for hours and hours and hours and hours. There is so much, like from a story nerd perspective, there is so much storytelling goodness here in this movie that I'll admit I was a bit overwhelmed. I really was. Um, It was a bit gruesome (laughs) in some parts that I was not expecting. Um, Maybe I only found like the bull castration gruesome because I wasn't expecting that. Um, It's it's the, what I like best about this story is that it sticks with you long after you've watched it. In fact, you kind of need to let it sink in a bit before you really start to understand everything that's going on here because it has layers after layers. I'd really be curious to compare it to the novel because, in my opinion, this is a story that lends itself to novel form, not really to a movie. Why is that? Because it's about what's going on inside the characters' heads, what they're thinking. And that's usually the domain of novels. As writers, when we study this story in particular, we've really got to pay close attention. It's a film about the things going on inside the characters. It's about what isn't happening on the surface. So to truly appreciate the craft, we've got to pay close attention to the performances. Now, there have been five other attempts at turning Thomas Savage's book into a movie, including Paul Newman. He wanted to be um, Phil Burbank. I can't see him as Phil Burbank at all. But anyway, (laughs) that's the role he wanted to play. But it was Jane Campion who finally pulled it off. I really, I can see why others struggled. It's not an easy thing to do. And all of the people involved with the power of the dog at every level, they had to have brought their A game to pull this one off. Now, I am going to focus on genre in this episode because it's the theme of the season. And because I think there's some really great lessons that we can learn about genre from it, including blending genres. This is an excellent example of what it means to blend genres and how a writer can go about it. But The Power of the Dog is also an excellent film to study for anyone who wants to learn more about writing scenes that work. One of my favorites is that piano banjo music off (laughs) scene. I don't know what to call it. Uh, you'll, if you've watched the movie, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you want to know how to write scenes that work, this is a great film. If you're interested in character development, this is a great film. Or if you want to learn more about how to build tension and escalate stakes. Um, Melanie, what were your initial thoughts of the movie? Well, I was actually dreading it to be really honest. Um, and before, because before I watched it, I really had a sense of the cruelty in Phil and the menace in him. And I I know how someone like Phil can treat a person like Peter and I've seen predatory behaviour and the power plays of deeply unhappy but charismatic people. But um, And Phil was exactly what I expected. However, Campion's restraint and her ability to threaten without having to show Phil's fully dark side on the screen 
I think, saved me from having to sit through the worst, what I thought was the worst case scenario. And um, Campion and the cast of The Power of the Dog have created a masterwork in storytelling. And this is not something that I think many of us could replicate unless you're Jane Campion. And I wouldn't attempt it at, at any stage right now. Um, but there are, like you said, many, many things that we can learn from The Power of the Dog. Um, to try and pin down its genre almost seems like a concept that is too simple for the complexity of the subject matter in this movie. Originally, I thought it was going to be a Western, but it's not. I think the only Western part of the movie is really the setting and the outfits that the, the cast wear. Interesting. You think it is not a Western. Hmm. All right. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i chose this i was really excited to see when the power of the dog came out i was really excited to see the the marketing for it and it is marketed as a western slash drama and here's why when i first became a story grid certified editor and i am focusing entirely on the story grid concept of genre in this episode by the way because i want to answer this question for myself so when i first became an editor in the story grid method a question came up amongst the, you know, the first class of editors about the Western and whether it was accurately categorized on the story grid genre clover. Now, honestly, I cannot remember who initially raised the question. It wasn't me. I did not have that insight. It was someone else's. But that question has been niggling at me ever since. And I thought this would be a really good time to, to dive into it a bit deeper. So in order to do that, first, I have to talk a bit about the story grid genre clover so that you understand what the heck I'm talking about. So in the story grid, what good editors know, Sean Coyne cites his references for understanding genre. And chief among them are Robert McKee and, and McKee's colleague, Basim El Wakil. Now, <laughs> this goes back to something I said a couple of episodes ago where I didn't realize that the idea of categorizing genre into five groups um, was McKee's. Clearly, I knew it <laughs> at one point because I... I had, when I went back to the section of the story grid, there's all kinds of notes in the margins in this section. So I knew it at one point and I forgot. So, you know, <laughs> good one, Val. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> McKee and Ella Keel are the ones who created the five distinct categories of genre. And it's Sean who has represented them graphically using what he calls the five leaf genre clover. Now, if you're a gardener, you will take one look at that graph and see that, first of all, it's not a clover. And second of all, there aren't any leaves in the picture. <laughs> there are petals, however. So the story grid five leaf genre clover is more accurately described as the five petal genre daisy. <laughs> as a gardener myself, this has always bothered me. So there, I have said my piece. Moving on. All right, the five areas on this genre clover are content, reality, time, style, and structure. So I'm only gonna talk about content and reality today. The content leaf refers to the, gen the general content of the story. It's more or less the plot. You know, for example, it's the action story or a love story or a coming of age story, that kind of thing. The content genre determines the theme and the controlling idea, as well as the value shift for the story. The reality leaf is all about the world in which the story takes place. Is it a contemporary novel or a fantasy or science fiction or historical? The genre clover lists the Western on the content leaf. So in other words, a Western is about the plot or the content of the story. Before I really started to study story, to me, a Western was High Noon or the John Wayne movies. The word Western conjured up a very specific setting and very specific conventions. In the story grid, Sean Coyne describes the Western as follows. The core values in the Western concern the individual inside and outside of society, good and evil, strong and weak, and wilderness and civilization. The core event is the showdown between the hero and the villain. And that's on page 93. Uh, Coyne also gives four subgenres of the Western, classical, where the stranger comes into town, vengeance, 
a stranger is intent on righting a wrong, transition, a hero becomes an outsider, and professional, where the hero is just doing his job, but he happens to live outside the law. All right, straightforward, but I have questions. Couldn't those subgenres apply to other content genres? For example, the Jack Reacher books are about a stranger coming to town and righting a wrong, you know, more or less. Society stories are also about those outside society, you know, the disenfranchised people. Westerns take place in a very specific environment. So how then are they different from, say, science fiction or a dystopian story? Now, I'm the first one to admit that I'm not an expert when it comes to Westerns. I know I have work to do in this area, and this episode is part of that work. As I said earlier, The Power of the Dog is marketed as a Western and a drama, and I can see why. The world that it takes place in, the setting and the landscape, the jobs that the characters do, as Melanie said, the, the costumes, like the clothes they're wearing, the way they talk, these are all the types of things that we expect to see when we turn on a Western movie. It's also set in a very specific time, 1925. So, you know, in that regard, it's, it's kind of historical fiction as well. We know that stories evolve over time, and as such, genres evolve right along with them. So while the Western might have been, you know, the John Wayne movies, what I'm wondering is, has it evolved from the 30s, 40s, and 50s to now? Because it's, you know, close on 100 years ago. The Western is classified in the story grid method as a content genre. Yet the content of The Power of the Dog at first blush is nothing like the content of the old Westerns that, you know, my dad used to watch. So has the Western evolved to be a story with any type of content, uh, but that must take place in the old American West? Does the West even have to be the American West, or could it be any kind of frontier or new land that's being settled? You know, what about other countries or other planets or space itself? You know, space is the final frontier after all. And if the Western is still a content genre, then at the very least, I think we can say that the conventions are evolving. So before I go into the rest of it, Melanie, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think that's a really valid point because um, I, especially about the Westerns, because I, like you, I went to my um, go-to texts about genre and what this movie is and I read the similar things to what you did and I came to the conclusion that it wasn't a Western because I saw the story arcs of the main characters as not really about the that didn't relate to me as the as the things that those texts had put out there as important as conventions and obligatory scenes for those genres so but that didn't help me come to a conclusion about what the actual <laughs> genre of the story was and I think I landed on it is many genres it is the the skill and the level of this story mean uh, and the storytelling means that it probably covers um, it, it. This movie covers many genres and uses many genres at different points of the story, and it and I think it combines them really well. And it depends on which character you're looking at at a different point in the movie to determine what genre it actually is. If that makes, I hope that makes some sort of sense. <laughs> yeah, it really does. I, I absolutely understand what you're talking about. Um, I had the same issue. What the heck genre is this? So I'm just going to bring you through my thought process here so that you can see how I came to the conclusion I came to. So first I thought, you know, is this an action story of all things? You know, it is, as I said, it's nothing like the Westerns I grew up with, at least I don't remember John Wayne ever struggling with his sexuality. <laughs> that might have been a movie I missed, but I think that one would have stood out. It's easy, in my opinion, to fall into the trap of thinking that Phil is the protagonist because his character does have more of an arc. And of course, because that role is being played by the biggest star in the movie and arguably one of the biggest stars in the whole world, 
but I think Peter is the protagonist, even though he's off stage for the first part of the middle build. And I think Phil is the antagonist. Now, okay, stay with me here for what I'm about to say. Bram Stoker uses this same basic story shape in Dracula. Yes, yes, you heard me right. I did say Dracula. In Stoker's work, the title character is the antagonist. He is the most complex character in that book, and the protagonist, who's Jonathan Harker, is off stage for the first half of the middle build, and Van Helsing has to come in, right, and fulfill that role of, of, um, of the protagonist. Now, with Dracula, having the protagonist off stage for so long, it doesn't quite work. But in The Power of the Dog, it works really well. And it's a really difficult technique. I can't understate this. Everything about this movie is at the master level. This is superior craft in every department. Like this is, like don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, but by all means, watch it and learn from it. This is people at the height of what they're doing here. I wondered if a Western would resonate with modern audiences because we don't get a lot of them nowadays. Yes, obviously Benedict Cumberbatch is going to get a certain amount of people to buy tickets and download it or whatever, whatever metric they use. But I wondered what people would think of the story itself. So I did check the Rotten Tomatoes score and it is a rousing success with both critics and audiences. So clearly people liked it. Now, I said Peter was the protagonist, but Phil is so well developed that we cannot simply pass him off as a stereotypical black hat, you know, the black hats that we find in Westerns. Although he does wear a black hat and Peter does wear a white hat. Phil has his own arc and his own story going on. I think it's probably more of a morality punitive story, but honestly, I didn't do a deep dive on Phil's arc. Um, but again, if you're interested in learning how to develop characters. This is a movie you want to see and Phil is a character you want to study. So the story opens and closes with Peter. In the beginning, we get his voiceover saying, what kind of man would I be if I didn't protect my mother? And in the end, he has protected his mother. So we've got the hero victim villain triangle happening where Peter, the hero, is protecting his mom, Rose, who is the victim, from Phil, who is the villain. There is life at stake. Phil is torturing Rose so much that she's drinking herself to death. We do see this dynamic in the Western, but it's also in action stories and thrillers. The power of the dog follows the conventions of an action story, and it follows the controlling idea for an action story. But it doesn't evoke the kind of emotion from the audience that a typical action story evokes. Yeah, I wouldn't call this film exciting. It's intense, it's gripping, it's enthralling, all those things, yes, 100%. But it's not exciting. So it is checking most of the boxes for an action story, believe it or not, yet this is not an action story. And I think it's pretty obvious it's not a thriller either. And Melanie, you mentioned crime. I considered whether it was crime as well, because justice is certainly being served here at the end. And crime stories are all about this justice-injustice value. The power of the dog also evokes the same emotion from the audience as a crime story, which is intrigue. I mean, it is impossible to take your eyes off the screen. It really is. But I don't think we can call this a crime story. Okay, so given that this film is primarily about what's going on inside the characters, I wondered whether this could be uh, an internal content genre film, a global internal story. In other words, is it a character-driven story? It does have that vibe. And it's obvious that Peter is sacrificing himself to protect his mom. He's behaving in a selfless way, and that's the stuff of morality stories. But Peter is altruistic at the beginning and at the end, so he's not really shifting in terms of, you know, being selfish at the beginning and then being altruistic at the end. And besides, none of the subgenres for morality really fit here, so I don't think this is a morality story for Peter, but it might very well be for Phil. For Peter, I think this might be a status story. Now, it's easy to, to think that a status story is all about how other characters perceive the protagonist. And yes, there are stories that focus on that, but the power of the dog isn't one of them. In fact, Peter's very careful to hide who he is and what he's done. He's very private. 
the outside world doesn't regard him any differently at the end of the film than they did at the beginning. But, and this is a big but, status stories are also about how the character sees herself. So for anyone writing women's fiction, where the protagonist is dealing with self-confidence or self-esteem, you could be writing a status story. For Peter, it's a sense of self-respect. Would he be able to look at himself in the mirror if he stood by and allowed Phil to torment his mother, possibly to her death? You know, what kind of man would I be if I didn't protect my mother, right? That's the question that starts this whole movie. So for Peter, I think it might be a status sentimental story because he's an underdog that succeeds against all the odds. But is this a story that's primarily about Peter and what's going on inside his head? No, it isn't. Uh, if it was, he wouldn't have been off stage for so long. And it would take Phil's whole arc and make it about Peter, which it isn't. All right, so now I'm, I'm down to Western. <laughs> is the power of the dog a Western in writer's terms? It is in marketer's terms, that's cool. But from a writer's pers perspective, can we call this a Western? It certainly has all the conventions, which are a harsh, hostile, wide open landscape, the hero, victim, and villain roles all clearly defined. A hero who wants to stop the villain and save the victim. A hero who operates outside the law, selectively or as a matter of course. And that's exactly what Peter does. A power divide between the antagonist and the protagonist that is really big. And a speech in praise of the villain. And in fact, there's multiple speeches in praise of Phil. None of the subgenres as identified in the story grid quite fit, but there's an argument to be made for Vengeance Western, which is where we, sort of like a vengeance crossed with a classical, I guess, which is where a stranger comes to town to right a wrong. It's not a clear example, but if you squint, you can kind of see it. <laughs> Peter isn't a stranger and he's from the area. However, he does go off to school and Rose, who has married George Burbank, moves to the ranch. So when school closes for the year, Peter returns to the ranch, not to the home he and his mother had shared. So if we look at it this way, we can consider Peter as the stranger and the ranch as the new town because Peter's unknown to them. One of the ranch hands, when he shows up, even says to Phil, is that him? Because they don't know him. If we look at it that way, it kind of fits, fits this vengeance subgenre idea. Now, the stranger who comes to town is the epitome of a free agent. He doesn't have any ties that bind him to a place or a group of people. This doesn't quite fit for Peter either. He's not a free agent. He is still a student who is dependent on his mother and George to pay his tuition and give him room and board and all that good stuff, feed him, clothe him. He must abide by the rules of the ranch, which is a metaphor for the, the, the new land or the new community or the new world of the story. And he is very much bound to his mother. He commits murder to protect her. <laughs> That's the whole point of the story, right? He wants to be a good son to protect his mother. He wants her to be happy. So Westerns are about freedom and subjugation. There is an argument to be made that Phil subjugates Peter. I mean, he certainly targets him. But I think Rose is the one who's really suffering here. <sighs> so while I think this is a Western content genre, it's loosely a Western content genre. It's mostly of, of all of the other genres, it's mostly Western. So Western can be a content genre, but I think that Western is also a reality genre. So we've got to look at it as both, I think. This brings me to this topic of blending genres. What's my ultimate verdict? Well, as I said, I think the power of the dog is closest to a vengeance Western, but it's not like anything we've ever seen before. Jane Campion is such a masterful storyteller that she's innovated the genre without compromising it. She's used a hyper-masculine genre to explore masculinity. Okay, so technically Thomas Savage did it because he's the one who wrote the book, but somehow or other she managed to translate it to a screen. We have never seen such a well-developed, empathetic villain in this genre before. We've never had a hero who has been so diminutive, so quiet, and seemingly weak 
even the women in Westerns haven't been depicted with these quote unquote feminine qualities. And in terms of Phil being empathetic, you can look at him as monstrous. Yes, just like you can look at Dracula as monstrous. But if you sort of put yourself in Phil's position, how he is having to constantly deny who he is, then he, he takes on another dimension. You may not empathize with him entirely, but you got to admit there's more to Phil than meets the eye. So without totally jeopardizing the main genre, which I think is a Western, Campion introduced elements of four other genres, at least four, action, crime, morality, and status. I mean, I haven't even touched on the love story or Rose's internal arc. I mean, there's, God, there's so much I could talk about here. Campion is able to do it all because she has a solid grasp of genre. So when writers tell me that they're innovating genre or that they're blending genre, really when I dig a little deeper and talk to them, what they're doing is randomly taking bits and pieces of genres and sticking them together. That's not how it's done. That isn't how you blend genre. All that does is create a Franken story that comes across to the audience as a confused mess. If you are bound and determined to blend genres, what you have to do is study each of the genres that you're going to be pulling from. And when I say study, it means reading widely and deeply, consuming consuming every story in that genre that you can find, whether it's a film, a TV show, a novel, a play, and pulling it apart and really seeing what makes it tick. You have to know how all of the genres that you're going to use as source material work so that you can pull elements from them that complement each other, that complement the main story that you want to tell and make the whole thing sing rather than making the whole thing flop. What do you think of that, Melanie? <laughs> oh, that's fascinating and, and really interesting, I think. I listened with a lot of interest about, you know, and with what you were saying. I, I'm still not convinced it's a Western because I do think it really sits internally in the, in the characters' heads. However, you put forward a very compelling case, I think, for it to be mainly framed as and mostly um, sits within that with a few extra things thrown into it as well. So I think they have some really good points. Um, and I, this week I tried a different way to look, out, look at the movie and work out what type of movie The Power of the Dog was. Um, first, I tried to look at the question of, well, whose story is told? And first, Phil, is it Rose's or is it Peter's? Um, I did consider George, but he's not in the movie enough to really be a viable contender, I think. So to me, the story is mainly focused on Phil with Rose and Peter close behind. But there's an interesting interplay between each of these characters, and they are all each other's antagonists. And I wish I had more time to actually explore that a little bit um, more deeply because the thing that really triggers Phil in this movie is the fact that Rose comes to the house um, and then Peter responds to the way Rose is being treated and how she's reacting to Phil's treatment of her. And then it just becomes this like interesting knot of Who's, trigger, or who's triggering who or who is doing something to antagonise the other in that, in that relationship between the three of the characters. Anyway, I found that really fascinating. Um, but it didn't really help me work out <laughs> what genre it was. And as, as we've already talked about, I think there are many layers and nuances and it would take a long time to really analyse how this story worked. And that, I think, it would be an activity that's worth time and effort. But for me, I went back to Truby's premise concept and the premise is the story stated in one sentence. And I thought about also what Valerie said in episode one, that a story is about one thing. And for me, the first part of Peter's opening monologue sets up the premise for the story. So Peter says, what sort of man would? And it goes on, of course, but I think that first clip of that sentence um, really let me look at the movie and th figure out what I thought it was about. So I, I think 
by using that beginning that beginning segment of that sentence, it I wanted to have a look at the men and the type of manhood they represent in this story. So there's Phil, and the question that comes to my mind um, is, what sort of man would turn his back on a on a career, torment Rose, and truly try to turn her own son against her? He is mean and bitter and cruel and he stymies anything of beauty that's around him, including music, frivolity, Rose, George, any affection and his family. And the Burbank parents even seem to be very afraid of him. The only time he lowers his defences and ceases to push himself onto the world is when he's in the grove with his memories of Bronco Henry. And I think even in the script, um, Jane Campion refers to the, to the grove as his as Phil's sacred space. So that's a really interesting. If you want to have a look, go and read the script because there's actually a lot of direction in the script for this movie that gives you an insight into the internal um, the internal thinking of the characters. And I found that was really helpful and really interesting this week as well. Now, I could say that Phil is a representation of toxic masculinity. However, I don't think that would do his character any justice and I don't think that's what Jane Campion was aiming for. Campion treats Phil with an amazing amount of compassion. His overt physicality is because he's closed himself off to one part of his life and that manifests itself in a destructive way. And that is why Rose's arrival sets Phil off because Rose represents love and intimacy for his brother. And Phil can't have that love and intimacy because Bronco's dead. And it's unlikely that Phil could ever really be who he is in 1925. And then there's Bronco Henry. And he is a ghost who haunts everything on the ranch. The younger ranch hands ask Phil about him. Bronco's saddle and other physical representation of him the representations of him litter the ranch. But what sort of man would have homoerotic magazines hidden in a suitcase in the woods and have a relationship with the young Phil? And that's sort of that's where I'm leading to, and, and that, that's how I was trying to think about Bronco. But I find Bronco's presence in the film incredibly interesting. He's an extremely important character, even though he's not physically in the movie. So, Valerie, what did you make of him? Yeah, let, let's go back to Phil for a second, because I want to just pick up on a few things that you said there. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch actually did use the phrase toxic masculinity when he was describing Phil. So it's really interesting that you used it as well. Phil, if we look at him as the antagonist of the story, the antagonist has to have a point, right? Otherwise, he's just a mustache twirling, you know, the stereotype. When he's talking about Rose, he's right. She, her drinking is out of control, but he isn't able to extrapolate that <laughs> he's the one causing it. <laughs> so that's really interesting because I do think he knows that. I think that he absolutely knows what he's doing. And I think he absolutely knows what he's doing when he befriends Peter as well. So I think that's part of the the nastiness of of um of phil this is who phil has become right he's got this uh you know toughen up attitude which is how he's treating rose you, you can't be delicate around here you got to toughen up because he's had to toughen up and suppress those parts of himself so everyone else needs to suppress them too now i'm reading into it because there's very little dialogue nothing is told to us directly in this film. It's a lot of uh, reading into it. It's a lot of trying to read characters' minds. So I might be totally off base, but he's interesting. And in terms of Bronco Henry, yeah, you, you cannot deny the importance of this character. He is a very real character in the film. His shadow hangs over everything. And he, he's essential. If you're going to have empathy for Phil, it's because of Bronco Henry's uh, role in his life. After all, Phil was only a boy when Bronco Henry targeted him. So what Phil is doing to Peter, Bronco Henry did to him. The power dynamic wouldn't have been equal then because he was just a kid like Peter. It's clear that they were lovers 
And, you know, I'm going to assume that the relationship was consensual because there's no indication, you know, one way or the other, whether it wasn't, wasn't. Bronco Henry was the only person that Phil could be himself with. Since his death, Phil has to be so restrained that it's eating him up. It's making him a very nasty person. It's making him succumb to the power of the dog. Yeah, and it, that's really interesting, isn't it, that a character that doesn't even appear on the screen has so much power in the story. And I think that's a real masterclass in living with the memory of someone. And I think if you writing a story about how the memory of someone impacts the people who are left behind, Bronco Henry and that relationship and that um, shadow he casts over the ranch would be a really excellent example and something that people should should study um, about how to how to cast that shadow and make it last in uh, and endure after someone's death. Um, but I found that really fascinating, considering that he wasn't even in the the film, but he's there and he's he's almost like he's living and he's definitely living in people's memories. So now I have a look at George. So he's an interesting counterpoint to Phil. Um, but he's the opposite side of the same coin and that's probably like a lot of brothers. He is just as lonely as Phil and he puts up with Phil's jibes and torments but he also quietly goes about his own life. He marries Rose, he invites guests for dinner but he also disappears. Um, And George is never really at the ranch to protect Rose from Phil or guide her on the role she assumes as the lady of the house. Um, But I do get the feeling that George will thrive when Phil goes, when he dies, um, because George has kept his own quiet strength despite Phil. And I think there's a, um, when we look at, you know, if I think about what sort of man would, I think George is a very um, interesting reflection and response to Phil's overt masculinity. And then we come to Peter, and Peter is completely different from Phil. His fine willowy features and consideration for others contrast with Phil's imposing and menacing presence. Peter knows who he is, and he's not afraid of that. He's intelligent and perceptive like Phil, but he also puts his intelligence to good use. Peter doesn't rage against the world like Phil does. He bends the world to suit his needs. So Peter is strong and he's strong in his convictions and he is in strong of mind. Um, Phil is strong in the physical world of the ranch and Phil, I believe, underestimates Peter and I think that comes across in the following lines from the movie where Peter says, um, when he's talking about his father, he used to worry that I wasn't kind enough, that I was too strong and Phil responds with, you, too strong, he got that wrong, you poor kid. And this is Phil's downfall. He's so confident in his physical strength that he doesn't even consider Peter a threat. Although Phil is the centre of the film for the first half, it's Peter that takes over for the second half. Peter is far a far more together character. He's not afraid of Phil. He's only afraid of what Phil is doing to his mother. And I'll just quickly mention the ranch hands um, because there are a lot of them and they are Phil's posse. And, um, and evidence of his charisma and how much he rules the ranch. Um, I think most of the ranch hands want to be like him and they also help him keep the legend of Bronco alive by asking Phil about him throughout the movie. And I'll just go back to the point I made before and I see this story really as an answer to Peter's question which, at the, which is posed at the beginning, which is what sort of man would I be? if I didn't help my mother. And I believe that this is the one thing that the movie is about. Now, Valerie, I know I haven't stuck to our genre theme, but I have tried to summarise this movie in a way that simplifies a very complex and layered story. So does what I sense, what I say make some sense to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you something. Do you think Phil is the main character? Uh I don't, I don't know. I, do, I think he is. I think he is the most, it is his arc that really gets explored in the, in the film. 
So from that perspective, he's the main character. And I think it's it then becomes a cautionary tale if he is the main character. But I do think that it is Peter who steals the show and it is Peter who, sh- who demonstrates how a different type of masculinity succeeds in the world. So I think it's about both of them, to be honest, even though Phil's screen time happens to be much more than Peter's. So <laughs> it's not a very straightforward answer. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think it's really about both of them and especially when I think about them in the context of that question about what sort of man would I be, then I think it's really about both of them. It's a fantastic movie. I'm actually really glad you picked this one for us to study. But you'd like it if I picked ones that weren't so hard. <laughs> no, well, I, I do. <laughs> well, yes and no. I think, I, I think because it, it's good to study such a masterwork and there's a joy. I've just enjoyed that and thinking about it. And I'll think about this movie, I think, for years. So I do enjoy that. It's just hard coming up with the answers for our weekly show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? Sometimes you don't need the answers. You just need the questions. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Carry on. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, again, the power of the dog was not what I expected. And like we just discussed, I think we could spend a lot of time deconstructing this story. Um, And it took me by surprise. And I really had to watch it a few times to pick up on some of the key points But I just want to highlight where I think there are four lines that really give us clues about what's happening and what is, um, or what's going to happen and what is happening in the story as it's told. So the first, as we've we've both talked about, is um, Peter's opening monologue, which is in full. When my father passed, I wanted nothing more than my mother's happiness. For what sort of man would I be if I didn't help my mother, if I did not save her? And the first time I watched this, I thought this was a really peculiar opening monologue. But on the second and third viewings, this quote really frames the movie from the start. So what it does is it highlights, it draws our attention to Rose when we meet her. So we know then who the mother is and we follow that, her path and what happens to her quite closely through the movie. So the second um, quote that I think is helpful is when Rose, who is drunk, tries to have a conversation with Peter. And what she's really trying to do here is to bring him back to her because she knows Phil is trying to use Peter to get to her. However, Peter says, you don't have to do this, mother. I will see that you don't. So at this point, Peter decides that he's going to help his mother. And in the next scene, He's reading a textbook and he's learning how to ride. And the textbook that he's reading is talking about anthrax. So it's a um, it's a biology or a disease type of text that he's actually reading in that next scene. The third point is where Peter's view of Phil starts to crystallise for us. So Phil talks about what Bronco Henry says makes a man. And then Peter responds by saying, my father said obstacles and you had to try and remove them. So Phil is the obstacle that Peter has to remove to save his mother. Then Phil, after that, Phil tries to convince Peter that Rose and her drinking are the obstacle that Peter needs to remove. But I think that's not really what's going on, and I think that's that's where we start to see Phil's downfall and really see Phil underestimate Peter and his love for his mother and what he would do to save her. And finally, while Peter waits for his mother and George to return from Phil's funeral, he reads Psalm 22, verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword and my darling from the power of the dog. The reference to the dog in this movie seems to be interpreted as Phil and his behaviour as letting his inner animal take over. But I looked at some of the interpretations of the scripture to get a better understanding of why this verse is used at this point in the story. So Psalm 22 actually describes the moment Christ dies on the cross. So this is where he lays down his life to save humankind. Deliver my soul from the sword is interpreted 
as Christ asking God to take his soul before he dies from mortal wounds. Verse 16 calls the enemy who nailed Christ to the cross dogs. So the dogs in verse 22 are the enemy. So if we look at this verse from Peter's point of view, he is willing to lay down his own life to save his mother's. He is saving her from the enemy, which is Phil. So there are some things to consider if you go and watch the movie again and you see those points in the movie. Have a think about those and have a, have a think about how they lay the path for us to get to the conclusion, which I still think is very satisfying actually at the end of the movie. And, and I, I can't emphasise enough how much I did enjoy watching this movie despite my... Um, my hesitation at, um, when you suggested it, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up because we could talk for hours. Okay, the action step. Today's action step is to consider your genre very carefully. Will you stick with one genre or do you want to blend genres? If you choose to blend genres, do you have a deep and thorough understanding of each of the genres you plan to introduce into your story? If you don't, you'll end up writing a Franken story. Well, that wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we discuss Dune. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For even more information about putting story theory into practice, subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to find more out about me, visit melaniehill.com.au or visit me on Facebook as Melanie Hill Author. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more and not less. So take one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.